Isaiah chapter 22, we're going to read verses 1 through 4. And since there are only four verses to read, let's read all four of them together out loud. Everyone now. The burden of the valley of vision, what aileth thee now? That thou art wholly gone up to the housetops. Thou that art full of stirs, a tumultuous city, a joyous city. Thy slain men are not slain with the sword, nor uh, dead in battle. All thy rulers are fled together. They are bound by the archers. All that are found uh, in thee are bound together, which have fled from far. Therefore saith I, look away from me. I will weep bitterly. Labor not to comfort me because of the spoiling of the daughters of my people. This morning, I want to bring a message that's entitled, As Long As. As Long As. You see, that's not even a complete sentence. It will become that in just a moment. And Father, I pray now that you might help me on this Sunday to say what should be said and refrain from what should not be said. Help me, Lord, if I, as I've already asked you today numerous times. And Lord, if you don't help me, I can't help anyone. For there is the arm of flesh, the Bible says, will fail you. And tonight I need you to, or this morning I need you to help me. And I ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. And of course, you may be seated. Mighty prophet Isaiah, and boy, he was a mighty prophet. And know how God used him in a marvelous way. And he was delivering a message to uh, a very stubborn and rebellious people. God used him in a mighty way to do so. The book of Isaiah, they say, is like a miniature Bible. Our Bibles have 66 chapters. The book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. They say the first 39, uh, the 39 books of the Old Testament, of course, and then 27 in the New The book of Isaiah can be divided the same way. First 39 chapters chapters basically deal with Old Testament things, and the next 27 chapters deal with the future, as does the New Testament. And so what had happened in the book of Isaiah here? God's people had neglected God's grace for way too long. They took God's grace to its end. You say the grace of God is is never ending. Well, there comes a time when God says that's enough. He doesn't let us continue. He's not like what we do with our children. We look at our kids and say, if you do that one more time, and how many times do we say that? Time and time again. And after a while, the child gets the idea that you didn't really mean it the first time. But God did this because the God is long-suffering and not willing that any should perish, he gave his his people lots and lots of time. And we're talking many, many years. God is long-suffering. He did not approve of their sin, but he gave them time to repent, and they would not repent. Now, we're not talking about getting saved. We're talking about a people that were God's chosen people. And he gave them the time that they should have used to get right with God, but they would not get right with God. They refused time and time again. And so they had neglected God's grace for the last time, and now it's time for more than simply a word of warning. As one young man said to me years ago, as I'm sitting in my home church, and the pastor gave me, my pastor gave me a lot of responsibility. I'm sitting with some of our boys that rode our bus, and one of them was a young teenager. And uh, he, was, he was missing a noodle in his chicken noodle soup, okay? Um, somebody slipped the cheese out of his sandwich. Um, he was missing a French fry. But other than that, he was pretty much of a normal teenager. He reached over and pinched my hand as hard as he could, right in the middle of the preaching. I looked over at him and I said, stop it, under my breath. He quit for a few minutes, and then he reached over and did it again. My hand right here grabbed hold of it and pinched the skin. I've told you this story before. It just happens to fit this sermon. He pinched my hand again. And I looked at him and I said, stop it. 
pulled his hand back. He reached over one last time. Now, he decided to really get with it, the kind where you raise up off of the pew. He grabbed my hand and started to pinch and leaned forward, leaned up off of the pew. And I said, all right. I said, you do that one more time. I said, we're going back to my office that the pastor had given me. And that was back in the day when you could get away with this. I said, I'm going to spank you. You say he was a teenager. Mm -hmm. Physically, mentally, he was a tad less than that. Well, he did it one more time. I said, okay, that's it. You were done. When church is over with, straight to my office. Well, took him back to my office and dealt with it as I should have. Probably would get arrested for that today. In fact, I'm pretty sure I would. But I had his parents' permission. He had a normal sister and four brothers that were just like him. I don't know how you can strike out that many times. I've just never figured that out. Took him back to my office, dealt with the problem. The next Sunday, we're standing in the back of the auditorium. And I looked at all those boys and I said, now listen. I said, I want you to behave in church. And the guy that I had dealt with the week before, he said to the rest of us, he says, you better listen to what he says because he means it. <laughs> well, that young man got to the end of my grace. And I dealt with it. Did he ever pinch you again? Nope, never did. He, in fact, he sat, nice and sat up straight in church and listened as much as he possibly could. But when God's people got to the end of God's grace, if I can use it that way in this context, let me show you what the prophet says. Look at verse 4 of Isaiah 22. And he said, therefore, and the rule is always when you find therefore in the Bible, you find out what it's there for. The previous verses is the therefore. And he said, therefore, said I, look away from me. I will weep bitterly. Labor not to comfort me because of the spoiling of the daughter of my people. He said, there's nothing that can give me comfort now. He said, we've, we've done this too long. And now God's judgment is going to fall. And his heart was broken. His heart was broken. This was not some kind of a cry where he was glad of what was going to happen. He warned them of God's judgment upon their sin. But would they listen? No, they would not. And they turned their ear from listening to the prophets. And they turned their ear from listening to God's word. They turned their ear from God and turned away. Isaiah was stirred up. You notice the words that we read a moment ago. For God's people had gotten the judgment of the Lord. He was stirred up. He saw what was happening. I want to thank God for a man who could not be comforted when he saw the people of God were in trouble. He took his life and his ministry very seriously. And he wept over the people. And he preached hard. And I think one of the most difficult things to do in ministry is to preach hard to your people. I know there are some people that live on that. I don't. I can preach hard. In fact, I can be just as mean-spirited as the next guy if I wanted to be, but I want to say this. As my pastor taught me, he says, no preacher ought to ever preach on hell without a tear in his eye. And I thought to myself, boy, that's true. And when God's people are disobedient and when God's people go astray and they go wrong and they go awry in their lives, there ought to be a brokenness in the pastor's heart uh, and the leadership heart and those that are around them. There ought to be a brokenness, not a gladness. As I was in the hospital uh, visiting someone, I went to visit another person who was in the hospital. And I remember he looked up at me and said, I know why you're here. You're here to tell me this is why God put me on my back. And I said, oh, no. I said, I'm not here to judge you. I said, I'm here to pray with you and try to encourage you. And I did. But there are some who are foolish enough and should probably stay away from all hospital visits. They don't need to be there who will look at somebody and say, well, now you, maybe you'll listen to God that he's got you on your back. The only place you can look is up. Well, that's, that's foolish. That's wrong. Let them judge themselves. Like one lady that came to see me while I was in the hospital after I had had my heart attack. I remember she looked at me and she said, as she's sitting down near the end of the bed on a little bench that was there, she looked at me with tears in her eyes and she said, I guess this is a wake-up call for me. Well, I didn't tell her it was. I believed it was. But she went right back to sleep. It may have been a wake-up call, but it didn't last long. And so let them judge themselves. Let someone with no wisdom do that. 
But it ought to break of of the leadership's heart when people won't serve the Lord and won't do what's right. When they get cold hearted and hard hearted and unfaithful and become disloyal, as I have often used that as a as a filler in a song that's in our songbooks. The truth of the matter is it breaks a pastor's heart when his people refuse to do what's right. It breaks a leadership's heart when the people decide to go their own way and they think everything's okay and yet you preach hard from the pulpit and you give warnings. There have been times when I've preached, I've wanted to go right down into the pew and grab somebody by their lapels and pull them up and say, I'm talking about your sin. I'm just talking to you. But I don't mention names. And by the way, in the 34 years I've been in this church and in the more than 45 years I've been in the ministry, I have never one time preached a sermon that was at someone. I've never done that. I didn't preach a hard sermon to get one person right with God. If a pastor doesn't have enough, uh, doesn't have enough guts, is that the right? Pro- Can I say guts? <laughs> if you didn't have the proper guts to go to somebody that's causing problems or has problems and confront them personally, he ought to get out of the ministry is what he needs to do. You don't punish people corporately before one person. But there have been times I've wanted to step out of the pulpit and grab somebody by the lapels and say, listen, buddy, I'm preaching about what you're involved in, but I've never done it. I illustrated it one time right down here. I think it was right where Brother Don is sitting this morning. Uh, There was a guy sitting behind him in that particular area, and I was illustrating it. And I grabbed him by the lapels and I pulled him up. And I'm talking to you, bud. And that was to illustrate it, but I wasn't preaching about him. I've never, I know people have thought that I was. You read my mail. My kids talked to you about it. My wife came to you. My husband came to you. And you're preaching to me because of that. No, 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 no. I don't do that. But I do recognize when people decide not to do right anymore. And it's very difficult for me as a pastor. And when Isaiah saw the people of God going through the judgment of God, the Bible, look what it says. He said, very, he says, I weep bitterly. And he says, don't even try to comfort my heart. Why? Because he saw all the judgment that he preached would come finally came. And I have joked through the years by looking at somebody saying, told you so. But I never look at someone and say, I told you so and mean it. I've never done that. At least it's not that I remember. In joking, I'll look at somebody that makes a, some, does something stupid as I told you, but I never look at somebody and say, I told you so, as a matter of judgment. Isaiah didn't go to the people and say, told you so. He decided to cry about it. His heart was broken. So the truth of the matter is, I want to thank God for Isaiah because of the examples that he sets here. Isaiah was one man who was not full of apathy, as so many are today. He was, not, he was not filled with apathy for the world in which he lived. Watching the news ought to break our hearts these days. Listening to the news ought to break our hearts these days. Rather than being mad at one candidate or another, it ought to break our hearts in the condition in which our country is in right now. It ought to break our hearts. I'm still heartbroken in my own heart over how many people in America believe in the killing of babies that it's okay. And to me, that's just amazing. Now, one man finally had the guts to take a, two more steps to get rid of Roe versus Wade and then put it back in the States. And it's not going to happen overnight, but it's happening one step at a time. And all I can say, I, I remember watching a video when they announced in one place that a woman could kill her baby in the ninth month and the people in the room stood to their feet and applauded. Does does that break your heart? Think about that. You say, Pastor, is this a political message? No, I don't have any political messages. This is a moral one. It's a biblical one. When I think about the many women today in this world who have miscarried a child, And I think about the children that could have been adopted into a loving home. But that's neither here nor there. What I'm simply saying is this, is it ought to break our hearts as we listen. So just what is apathy? Apathy is that I don't really care attitude. 
when I was in high school, a young man gave a message on uh, on uh, lethargy and apathy. <laughs> and it was one of the funniest speeches I've ever heard in my life. He says, and I don't really care what you think. Well, that was apathy right there. And it was, it was a good, I love my speech class and I love this guy was so creative and he really was. But apathy today has inundated Christianity. It's the I don't care attitude. You know, whatever may be, you know, whatever will be, will be. The Doris Day song. Que sera, sera. Devil may care. Truth of the matter is, it doesn't mean you need to go downtown and carry a sign and protest. And it doesn't mean you need to go down here to the abortion clinic, right down here off of Centennial, and protest every week. It doesn't mean that at all. But it ought to drive you to your knees. And it ought to make you pray. And it ought to break your heart. And God, even though Second Chronicles 7.14 has to do with the dedication of a temple, even though, and it does, by the way. God still gave a formula that is universal, not just Old Testament. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, four things he asked them to do, humble themselves. That means to put themselves under God's authority. The letter H underneath. Humble themselves and pray. Well, that's the word pray means ask. John Rice taught us that prayer is asking. And then he said, seek my face. Why was that? Isn't that the same as praying? No, God had turned his face away from his people's sin. And they wanted God to turn around and look at them again. Like it says in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, make thy face. I think it's Deuteronomy. If I'm wrong, I still got the verse right. Where they said, make thy face to shine upon thy servant. And seek my face and then turn from their wicked ways. That's self-explanatory. He says, then will I forgive the sin and will heal their land. He, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, where God says that the Lord's hand is not short, that it cannot save, nor his ear that he cannot hear. But he says, but your iniquities are separated between you and your God, he says. But he says, but if you'll change that, he says, I'll turn around, I'll listen to you. Psalm 66, 18, if it says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. He said, that's Old Testament. So is Psalm 23, so is Psalm 91. Don't ever forget Proverbs chapter three. Those are all Old Testament. The principles are there. They have never changed. God says he's the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. So just remember the principles are there, even though it may not be the same practice. Don't ever forget that. Apathy is that I don't care attitude, and we ought to be able to say along with the prophet Isaiah, labor not to comfort me. But my title today is as long as. Well, I want to say this, labor not to comfort me, number one, as long as there is a place called hell. And by the way, hell will be here forever. If you look in your Bible to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, it's a passage for which many Christians have become cold-hearted, hard-hearted, unfaithful, and disloyal. But it's still in the Bible. And the prophet says, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were delivered up, delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Labor not to comfort me as long as there's a place called hell. And the fact that people don't believe in it doesn't change the truth of it. There's a universal truth that simply exists. Two points. Number one, save people go to heaven when they die. End of report. Save people go to heaven when they die. Point number two, unsaved people go to hell when they die. Universal truth doesn't change. I don't believe in hell. Uh, but Jesus did. And I'm not smarter than him. And he believed in it. And hell is spoken of twice as much as heaven is in the Gospels. Why? Because Jesus gave his life to save people so they wouldn't go to hell. 
Heaven is not for good people and hell is not for bad people. Heaven is not for those whose good works outweigh their bad works and hell is not for those whose bad works outweigh their good works. No, heaven is for the saved and hell is for the unsaved who never received Christ as their savior. You see, those who are unsaved, those who have never trusted Christ as their savior, and that's why I encourage you, get the gospel out. Those who are listening to my voice right now who haven't passed out a gospel track in the last seven days, get gospel tracks and get them in people's hands. You say, well, I'm not around unsaved people. Sure you are. Everywhere you go, there are unsaved people. Restaurants you eat in, gas stations that you go to, everywhere you go, there's unsaved people. Say, well, they, they might think I'm a Christian. Well, pray tell, what do you want them to think you are? They might think I'm a fanatic, then be thought of as a fanatic. They'll just throw it away. One of our dear ladies, God bless her, she doesn't live here anymore. Uh, but one day she had her a handful of tracks, went to the store up in Woodland Park outside of City Market, and we're just passing, everybody gets one, just passing out tracks. Parking lot was filled with tracks that people had thrown down. But she was faithful because some people kept their tracks. Set up a ministry many years ago, our people got involved with. It's called the candy cane ministry. And one of our gospel tracks and a candy cane, uh, candy cane was glued or taped to a gospel track. And they got permission to stand outside Walmart and hand it to everybody that came by. I still got some of those tracks. We ordered hundreds and hundreds of those tracks. We'll be using them this year to, uh, on the 31st. We'll be using some of those tracks that we bought then. Just getting the seed out of the barn. Why? Because there might be some poor fool that's going to believe the gospel and get saved. Amen and amen. But they're not going to get saved by osmosis. And God doesn't walk around sprinkling spoofle dust on top of people's heads so that they'll get saved. And nobody's going to get saved sitting next to so-and-so in a church someplace because the gospel is just going to ooze over to them and, and they're going to absorb it. It's not going to happen that way. The Bible says faith cometh by what? Hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God, you see. And that's how they get saved. Labor not to comfort me as long as there are those who preach something besides Jesus saves. I want to say this morning plainly, Mary is not the co-redemptrix as taught by some religions. Mary was a good woman, and I know that because God chose her to be the mother of the very Son of God. She was not sinless, and Jesus came to save sinners, and Mary said, listen to what my son is saying. She called herself a sinner in her prayer. No, she's not the co-redeemer. There's no saving grace in the name of Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace. <laughs> I'm sorry, she's not a savior and never has been and never. Say, you're condemning a religion. Any religion that teaches something besides Jesus as the savior is wrong in every way. And I want to simply say this. Don't labor to comfort me as long as there are people down the street from here saying you got to work your way to heaven. You have to live right to go to heaven. God will reward your faithfulness and take you to heaven. You'll be good enough to go to heaven. No, all of our righteousness is ours, filthy rags, God says. There's not a good thing about me that'll take me to heaven or keep me in heaven. It's only Jesus and that's it. Listen to what I say next. Number two, don't labor to comfort me as long as there are believers away from the Lord. Don't labor to come for me as long as they're backsliders. Timberline Baptist Church is not a country club. It's not a place where, it's, it's not a country club. It's not a museum where everybody comes to look at the religious relics. This is a hospital where people can get right with God if they will simply listen. Not every sermon, listen, sometimes uh, sermons can be a lot of things. Sometimes a sermon, you're looking at a sermon and it's a treasure chest and the people come in and look at it. And ah, it's some kind of a treasure chest in it. I wonder what's in it. And then there are some sermons where you open up that treasure chest and people go, oh, that's what's in it. Oh, wow, that's great. Look at all those diamonds and rubies and gold and silver and all kinds of things. Boy, what a great. And there are some sermons where I invite you to take your fingers and run it through them. Pick them up and look at them. 
man, and put some in your pockets and look at all these rubies and, and pearls and diamonds and wow, and you walk out feeling good all over. And there's some sermons where I pick stuff out of that treasure chest and throw it at you. <laughs> but that's all of the kind of preaching because we need all of it. Am I right? We need all of it. Preaching involves three things, teaching you, reminding you, and then giving you something that you can change your life. Listen, the word of God is so clear, but there's going to be Christians who are away from the Lord. Second Timothy chapter four and verse 10, the Bible says, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. That's one of the hardest statements in the entire New Testament. Here sits the apostle Paul in prison, writing to a young preacher, trying to encourage him named Timothy. And he makes this statement. He said, people have forsaken me. He said, Demas, let me tell you why Demas left. And then you go back and you read about Demas in the New Testament. And you find out he was a co-laborer with the apostle Paul. He worked with him. I've often likened him to a, to a person who goes into a city and prepares for a special meeting. You know, Paul's coming. Let's get the stadium ready. Uh, Paul will be here soon. We need seating over here and letting people know that the, that the man of God was coming. I've often, maybe Demas was one who polished Paul's shoes. Maybe he was one who took his robe to the dry cleaners so he wouldn't have to. Maybe he was one who would run to the store and, buying some, and buy some groceries so that they, he wouldn't have to take time away from preaching and witnessing and all that. I don't know what all Demas did, but he was a co-laborer. And then he left Paul. But he didn't just get tired of what he was doing. He may have, but the Bible says he was having an illicit love affair with the world. Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world. I guess he got tired of the Christian life. He got tired of the responsibilities of the Christian life. And, and got to go to church, got to make the donuts, got to get in the car, got to drive to do this. It's early in the morning. It's cold outside. Maybe he got tired of all that. Maybe he was tired of changing the tire on his, on his chariot. I have no idea. But he quit. And he decided he was going to go back to the pigsty from which he had been saved. And there are just, there are many Demases in the world. And by the way, not just Demases, there are prodigal sons. Many children of God have left God's will and God's way to live in the world for a while. They had to take a little hiatus. I believe sometimes Christians get burned out but I think I don't believe in burnout camps for pastors. I really think I don't. The Bible doesn't ever talk about that. The Bible tells us when to get away, but it doesn't tell us to go away from our church for three months at a time and, and get spiritually revived. If you need three months to get spiritually revi revived, there's something else wrong with you. And I mean that with all my heart. The Bible tells us you wait on the Lord and he'll give you the strength. And that doesn't mean serve the Lord. That means you wait on him. You take your weakness and you wrap it around his strength and you let him give you the strength. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. The, the answer is in the Bible. Well, I just need a break. Then get on your face before God and take that break in your private place. And Demas quit, walked out on Paul. Everything that Demas did for Paul, guess what? Paul had to do it. Say, well, what's wrong with that? Was he a lazy preacher or something? No, God gave him helpers. Do you know in the Bible, God gave deacons so that the pastors could devote themselves to prayer and preaching? Didn't mean the pastor was lazy. All it simply meant was God gave him helpers. That's all. God gave pastors to the church and God gave deacons to the pastor. It's really an amazing thing that God does. Why? So that they all help one another in all of this. We all have a part. Pastor can't do it all. The leadership can't do it all. Paul couldn't do it all. So God gave him a man named Demas and other people. What did De Demas do? I don't know everything that he did, but I know that everything he did, everybody else had to make up for it when he quit. As Isaiah did, there needs to be somebody who cares that there are people who have wandered away from the will of God and do what they can to bring them back. 
over the years, I'm not a good example, and I know that, but I have begged people to get right with God. Have they always listened? No. They're like everybody else. They're not willing to be right with God, confess their sin, and any of the rest of it. I remember going to a home one night where an entire family had quit everything, knocked on their door, looked to my left, and saw them peeking out their their um, Venetian blinds to see who was at the door, would not come to the door, would not answer the door, would not talk to me. And I was never unkind to them. And by the way, that's my testimony. I, I would stack that up in any lie detector. I was never unkind, but I gave warning. And they never came back. I don't even know what they're doing now. I hope they're doing okay. I really do. I hope another pastor was able to help them if they ever found another pastor. I really, truly do. Uh, I, one man can't pastor the whole world. Maybe somebody else could help them. I don't know. And by the way, it's not just the younger people that wander away from God. And I was a youth director for many, many years. And I'm here to tell you, we lost some along the way. And uh, for all the years that we were in youth work, not everybody did everything that was absolutely right. My goodness, no. Uh, some did wrong. <laughs> We've had young people, listen, that, that got onto drugs and got into alcohol, got into these. Uh, I remember one of our young people, after we had gone from uh, there, got into this anorexia nervosa and starved herself to death and literally died. Amazing thing. But I did read a testimony. He's just here recently. It was 43 years ago that a young man named Steve Otterdahl uh, got on his bike after he had a few crosswords with his mom. He was 12 years of age. All 12-year-olds say cross things to their moms. Robin and I were on vacation. We had made it to Indiana at that particular time. Got a phone call. And the phone call was that Steve had gotten killed in an accident. Got on his bike and started down Highway 3 in a big old Pepsi 7-up truck hitting knocked him 100 feet, hit his head up against the curb of the street, hit him right on his inion, killed him. The inion is that knot on the back of your head. Killed him instantly. That was 43 years ago. We got the news. And what was this young man like? Well, when he went to vacation Bible time, he memorized his verses like he was supposed to. and got. We had a big vacation Bible time. We would have 1,500 a day at vacation Bible time. That's a lot of kids. Yeah, you say, that's impossible. No, that was an average of 1,500. He would work hard. We had a bounce house. We had, uh, we had a dunk tank. We had a uh, cotton candy machine. And they could earn tickets and they could buy things. And they could play the games, not just go to class and not just have the auditorium time, but they could do all that. He would earn his tickets. This is what Steve did. He was 12 years of age. He would make me cry. He would earn his tickets and he would go to the table and buy Bibles and bookmarks and pens and pencils that had Jesus written on them. And he would give them to the bus kids. He didn't keep them for himself. You want to talk about a good kid? Killed him instantly. 43 years ago. Today, today's the 20th. 20, it was 43 years ago yesterday that he got killed. Robin and I were in uh, Indiana. We got a phone call. We were staying uh, uh, I've got to think, I think it was the Mitchells. Weren't we at the Mitchells uh, that we stayed there that night? Uh, can't remember, right outside the college. And we got in the car the next day and drove back to Minnesota, cut our vacation short. So what happened? Knocked on the door that night. When the door opened, his older brother, Mark, two years older than him, looked and said, see, Mom, I told you they would be back. And we were. And what I'm saying is, is that sometimes it's worth every sacrifice that you make. Labor not to comfort me as long as there are people away from God because somebody needs to come back to God. Somebody needs to get right with God. Somebody listening to my voice today, either in this room or on the line right now, we got a good audience now. I found out by looking at the numbers, we have hundreds every week that tune into this broadcast, literally. Only a few respond by writing but hundreds actually watch the video. Someone within the sound of my voice today needs to get right with God. That's it. Many adults wander away from the Lord. Who do you think paved the road for the young people? Often it's a backslidden dad, mom, grandpa, grandma, 
somebody that made a decision to visit Egypt for a while and take a hiatus from the will of God. Thirdly, labor not to comfort me as long as there are people with needs. And I'm not talking about the fake guy or woman that stands on a corner with a sign that says, like right down here off at 8th Street, he held up a sign that says, don't want food, don't want money, I want marijuana. Hello? Of all things. I'm not talking about the guy that lives in a three, $400,000 home that decided to get some tax-free money. I'm talking about the ones that are real poor and real needy. Get a phone call. Somebody just stole my, 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 my food card. Can you come buy my groceries for me? Really? Somebody just stole your food card right now? Really? Is that right? While you were standing there in that store and had a cart full of food, and you're going to tell me that somebody just walked up and stole your food card? Hey, I got that call this week. But then there's families like what walked in here one day, a bunch of children, every one of them had red cheeks and runny noses and all of them had fevers. And they said, can you help us buy some medicine for our children? And I'm thinking, man, you better believe I can. And I bought their medicine that they needed. You did with your tithe money. Yeah, or not like the fellow that came by here one day who said he was a pastor and his transmission went out and needed $600 and I gave it to him because he said he was a pastor and he said he was going to pay us back. Never saw him again. I remember what Joanna said to me that day. She said, do you realize you just gave him three weeks of my pay? And we never saw it again. Yeah, that at that time she was getting $200 a week. As long as there are needs. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 through 40, for I was in hunger and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw thee, O stranger, and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? I love this next verse. You know what it says? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Wow. It ought to bother us that there are few who try to reach the lost. It ought to bother us that there are few who try to help the poor. It ought to bother us that there are few that live for others. And it ought to bother us that there are those who try, who, uh, who never try to even feed the hungry. It ought to bother us that there are those, there are few who try to save the lives of the unborn. And abortion is still a sin. It's still wrong. It's not a political issue, even though it's been made one. It's not a political issue. And anybody with half of a brain stem knows that. It's a moral issue. Killing the innocents was a sin in the Bible. What we do for others, we truly do for Christ. And what we do not do for others, we do not do for Christ. And what I, what I do and think of others is my basic attitude, attitude toward Jesus. So labor not to comfort me yet, but as long as, as long as these things exist. The truth is there are many today who want the comfort of God, who can, uh, all the comfort that God can give, but they're not interested in bringing a little comfort and peace to others who have needs. Second Corinthians chapter one, verses three through six. Listen to these verses. Blessed be God, even the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Wow. I wonder if being a person of comfort is being Christ-like. Apparently it is. Who comforteth us, us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Do you see a main key verse in our key word there? 
For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by, uh, aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. As Isaiah said, as long as the people of God have a need, I labor not to comfort me. The salva are you concerned for the salvation of the lost? What about the false doctrines that have been taught so many that are literally sending people to a Christless hell? Jesus plus and minus anything is salvation. You, take, you add anything to it, you take anything away from it, it's not salvation. That's why we believe in Jesus, period, for salvation, plus and minus nothing. What about being concerned about the restoration of a backslider and being concerned enough to say something? What about the needs of the, what about the, needs of the needy or the lives of the unborn? As some of us are comforted from day to day, maybe we need to decide not to be comforted sometimes. And maybe the troubles that are around us ought to drive us to our knees from time to time and keep us praying. Is this a rebuke to the Timberline Baptist Church? If you took it as that, it is not. What I'm saying is, is that there are a lot of things that always bother us. Because after a while, all of us become calloused to a lot of the things that are around us that no longer bother us. And I'm kind of hoping that the Lord will help me not be as calloused as I have been about some of these things. And let's pray.